I've been here with you. Uh, periodically, we do these deep dive conversations with people who just have made extraordinary contributions to our, you know, public knowledge and dialogue and debate. And, uh, you know, we call this Conversations with Great Minds. We're doing one right now the, over the next 30 minutes here with Kate Pickett. She is professor of epidemiology, research champion for justice and equality, deputy director of the Center for Future Health at the University of York, the co-author with, with Richard Wilkinson of several books, including their latest that was just released today, The Inner Level, How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity, and Improve Everyone's Well-Being. The website is equalitytrust.org.uk. Uh, the Twitter handle, Prof K.E. Pickett, P-I-C-K-E-T-T. -T. Professor Pickett, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. It is, it is so great to talk with you. I have been quoting uh, the work that you and Richard Wilkinson have been doing for, for, I've been quoting it for years, you've been doing it for years. Uh, in, I've quoted it in my writing, I've quoted it in my books, I've quoted it on radio and TV. I, I think it's just such important work. Uh, let's start at the beginning. How, first, let's define inequality. What is inequality? How does it come about in our societies? Well, what Richard and I have been studying for a long time is income inequality. So that is the gap between the rich and the poor in different societies. And it's not the same in every society. In some countries, the rich are much, much richer than the poor than they are in other countries. Um, we look at income inequality because it's, it's quite easy to get hold of those data. Wealth inequality is obviously important as well. But we think of these as, as you, you might think of them as sort of the vertical inequality of society, how steeply the social pyramid is structured, how big the social distances are between those at the bottom and those at the top, and those between everybody on all the different rungs of the ladder as well. So it's a little bit different to thinking about what we might think of as horizontal inequalities like gender inequality, ethnic inequality, religious inequalities, language inequalities, disabilities, etc. These are the vertical inequalities, the structure of society, um, the distances between us. So what are, what are the principal consequences of inequality? How long have you got, Tom? Yeah, no, I've, they, they I've, I've read immense, your books. And, they are immense and extensive. Yeah. Um, there are effects on our health, both physical and mental. There are effects on our relationships, both our intimate relationships and um, more broadly in society, things like levels of trust and civic participation, levels of violence, etc. Um, there are effects on the environment. There are effects on our economy. There are effects on children's life chances. Can, Kate, can we extensive? Can we pick? Uh, can we uh, pick some of these out, or, or define some of these? Pull them out, and, and 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 for example, how is the fact that the guy living down the street from me is worth three billion dollars, or actually, in the case of Phil Knight with Nike, probably worth a hell of a lot more than that, and he does live right down the street, uh, not nearby, but you know. Um, how does the, and, 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 and I'm not, you know, I'm not worth millions of dollars. How does that translate into, uh, into, into the specifics that you just, how does that translate into higher crime rates? How does that, how does that translate into less social cohesion? How does that cause me to be less trusting of my next door neighbor who's not a billionaire? It's quite simple, really. Um, we are social animals. We have evolved to be extremely sensitive to how other people see us and how we think about ourselves in relationship to other people. Mm -hmm. And so anything that sort of strengthens the grip of what class and, and status anxieties, the grip that they have on us, anything that makes those worse tends to make us feel worse. It's a source of chronic stress. It's a source of feeling... Um, devalued or disrespected and so it's those it's those social links those sort of psychosocial links our evolved sensitivity to class and status that mean we suffer much more when those when those status issues become much more salient and more important back in the 70s when I was living in Michigan there was a study that came out of uh, I think it was done at Michigan State University um, I, I, rem I, you know, I don't have the study. I in fact, I've never been able to find it, but I remember vividly hearing this uh, radio story about it uh, out of, out of uh, WKAR, the, uh, the campus station, um, and I think it was on NPR, uh, that they, you know, squirrels build nests out of leaves in trees. And in the winter, when the leaves go away, you can see all the squirrels' nests. And so what they did was, and, and you know, squirrels are territorial, 
And so what they did was they took a, a couple, two or three squirrels' nests in an area that had 10 or 15 of them, and physically went up and added about 20% of more mass, more leaves to their nests, and then just sat back and said, let's see what happens. And what happened was that all the other squirrels, or the majority of the other squirrels in the area, started expanding the size of their nests. And then they, they were speculating, is this the way that squirrels communicate to each other, that they think a heavy winter is coming, or does this have to do with social status? But isn't, isn't that sort of a, a, a variation on what you're talking about, that, that when we see people around us who have bigger homes than we do, it makes us feel an urge to get to there? Exactly. I think your squirrels are a lovely analogy, actually, and um, we have evolved you know, to have very much the same sorts of feelings. Um, but it's, the key thing is, is that it's not the same in every country, in every state, in every society. In some places, those feelings about how you're doing relative to other people matter more than in other places, and so are a more important cause of ill health or problems of violence or whatever it is. And, and it's the degree of inequality in those different societies that is driving how much people feel that their relative status matters. So, so if, if, if the billionaire down the street from me has you know, $1 billion and thus has this giant compound and has a yacht out in the, you know, in the harbor or whatever, um, you know, I, I see that house and I go, oh, gee, you know, I, I feel diminished by that. But if he suddenly has $10 billion, I mean, the Koch brothers, they went from being worth $10 billion a decade ago to being worth $80 billion now. If, he, if he's suddenly worth $10 billion, I don't see that much difference, I don't think. You know, he still has that big mansion. How does that, how does that increase in inequality cause me, or you know, the average person, to, to feel worse about myself and about society? How does that drive up things like STD rates and teenage pregnancy rates and crime and stuff like that? Because we are all aware of the structure of society. Um, and it might not be that that particular person having X amount more billion dollars um, affects you personally, but the fact that you're living in a society where lots of people are now earning those huge amounts of money and other people have less chance of, of doing so. And so that changes the game for everybody. Um, so we're all affected by inequality. The rich are affected by it as well, because you might be really literally just down the road from that billionaire, but not making quite as much yourself. And so you, you know that in the eyes of the world, your status is a bit less than that person's status. And so it matters. Yeah. Um, our intimate, let, let, let's break out some of these, the, the, the social effects of the gap between rich and poor. Um, first of all, you said a minute ago that in some societies, that, that wealth gap has a greater impact on the average person than in other societies. What, what accounts for that difference? Is it simply how, how stark that difference is? Yes. Yes, we think that that's right. So, um, so it's not religion and, uh, or society or culture. No, it's, this is a human no, thing. Exactly. Um, this is a very robust body of evidence now. I think you had my co-author on your program probably about 10 years ago mm -hmm. when we were first starting to, to write publicly about these relationships. And since then, the research has really deepened and intensified and broadened. And it's now very clear that these are causal processes. You know, that when the level of inequality changes in some place, then things like levels of child well-being um, change. Um, and, and the sort of the pathways from one to the other have, have been really um, cleared up a lot. But what I, I think it would be really good to focus on this afternoon is, is mental health, actually. Sure. Go for it. Because, you know, I'm r really in the UK... We are in the middle of a, a mental health epidemic, and you know my sense is that you are in the U.S. as well. Yes. You know I've been looking at some statistics. I see that Gallup says that about 80% of Americans feel stressed every day. 20% live with mental illness, um, and then there's another survey showing that over half of your young people have a mental health issue, and we've got very similar levels um, in the U.K. And that's a truly astonishing level of distress. Um, and so trying to understand why some countries have this epidemic of mental illness and other places, you know, rich, developed countries in other parts of the world, they don't have that. Well, isn't the difference between the U.K. and the U.S. on the one hand and Germany, France, Finland, Denmark, whatever it may be on the other hand, that those countries never had Reagan or Thatcher. They never had neoliberalism introduced you know, injected into the bloodstream of their society in a really, really big way that led to an explosion 
of, of incredible wealth and, and an exacerbation of poverty. Isn't it, doesn't it just come right down to that, 1978 to 1980? Well, exactly. That's when we saw our levels of income inequality rise dramatically, and they have never yet um, come down again. You know, there are little ups and downs along the way, but we saw that huge rise with neoliberal ideologies. But I think that the point that we should be thinking about really is that back in the day when Thatcher and Reagan were deciding on their economic policies, they could truly believe that what they were putting in place was going to be for the greater good. They had theories that, you know, trickle-down economics would um, improve people's lives, that, you know, deregulating everything and freeing up markets would improve everybody's lives. But now we know that that's not true, and we see the evidence that that rise in inequality has actually caused these huge levels of mental distress, physical health problems, the destruction of civic society. So we have evidence in front of us now that can allow us to make different choices and we're not we're not working in the in the dark anymore you know we've got evidence upon which we can build policy yeah and that's that's important stuff and i, I, I want to speak to that in just a moment we got to take just a very very quick break here we're talking with kate pickett professor of epidemiology research champion for justice and equality deputy director of the center for future health at the university of york in the united kingdom and she's the co-author with Richard Wilkinson of uh, several books. The, uh, the, the Spirit Level was absolutely brilliant. This most recent one just came out. It's called The Inner Level, How More, e more Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity, and Improve Everyone's Well-Being. We're talking to Kate Pickett, the professor of epidemiology and co-author of uh, The Inner Level, the new book. Kate, uh, or Professor Pickett, uh, the, you were just talking about how uh, you believed, and I, I believed for a long time that, that Reagan and Thatcher were, you know, in the thrall of, of uh, uh, the Chicago school and the Austrian school, you know, Hayek and, and, uh, and whatnot, and, and actually believed that if they could increase inequality, if they could make the rich richer, somehow that would all translate down to, to average working people. Um, in the 1880s in the United States, there was a fairly large body of, of um, uh, I was going to say literature, it was more propaganda, uh, promoting the idea of things like deregulation, tax cuts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, the, and the theory was called the horse and sparrow theory. You can, you can Google this. You probably already know about this. And what they said, what, they, what, the, what the wealthy people in the United States were saying in the, in the, in the era of you know, 1880 to 1920 um, was, uh, because back then everybody had horses, was, um, you know, the sparrows eat horse poop, right? They eat the undigested oats out of the horse poop and, uh, or horse dung. And if you, if you feed more oats to the horses, um, more will pass through that they can't digest rapidly and the sparrows will get fatter and be happier. And this was literally called the horse and sparrow theory about why we need to be feeding the fat, you know, the, the, the financially fat people in our society uh, or, you know, uh, entities. Um, and, and that was largely, I mean, that became actually a point of debate in Teddy Roosevelt, during T Teddy Roosevelt's presidency. He took that on. And, and then Franklin Roosevelt again. And, and, and everybody figured out that that was just complete BS. <laughs> and now we're back to it again. How does that happen? How does that happen? Um, I think it happens when we allow our policymaking to be captured by vested interests and when we have a reduction in, in democracy um, and people feeling that they can participate in, in policymaking. You know, we shouldn't be making um, our social policy, our tax policy, our welfare policy um, on the basis of the vested interest of the top 1% or, or the very rich. We should be thinking about how we create societies that optimize well-being for the largest number of people and I think that involves um, getting more people engaged in the political process and saying what it is they do need and what it is they do want and I think also we need to stop trusting that you know those with vested interests have our best interests at heart or indeed the best interests of, of the institutions they work in. In our new book, we've got a chart that shows if you look at shareholder return in large companies, you get the best shareholder return among those where the chief executives are paid less than average compared to those where they're paid more. So I think there's a certain amount of misbusting that needs to go on about who it is who should be helping us think about the policies we need and the way our societies should be moving. 
And I think worldwide there is um, a growing movement towards thinking about alternative economic models, thinking about outcomes that we want that would be different to simply growth in GDP, gross domestic product, but instead growth in well-being. Yeah. I think there is a movement towards this. Yeah, but, uh, the, the uh, story out of Bhutan has certainly had an enduring um, kind of seductive quality. I don't know how true it is, but uh, you know, the, the National Happiness Index or Gross National Happiness Index. Uh, we're talking with Kate Pickett. Uh, the, the book, the brand new book, The Inner Level, How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity, and Improve Everyone's Well-Being. We'll be right, right, right back. Welcome back. We're talking with Kate Pickett, uh, co-author of The Inner Level, a new book about uh, inequality and equality. Kate Pickett, uh, co-author of The Inner Level, a new book about uh, inequality and equality. Kate, in the, in, the, in the few minutes we have left here, uh, maybe uh, three or four minutes, um, how do we... How do we break this grip that massive inequality has, has uh, seized us with? Uh, you know, the, the last time this happened was the late 1920s, early 1930s in both your country and mine. And what broke that grip was a massive worldwide depression, you know, followed by a war. And, and, and you know, that, that kind of uphe upended the entire economic and political order. Uh, what's it going to take this time? Um, I think what might be really key is that achieving greater equality is going to be a precondition to solving climate change. You know, we are going to have to find ways to rein in consumerism and status consumption and get everybody to feel that they are um, working together towards a common goal. Mm. So the need to deal with climate change might be an impetus for us creating more equal societies. I think also this recognition that the pursuit of economic growth on its own doesn't produce high levels of population well-being and damages the environment is another reason for us to take tackling inequality seriously. But the hopeful thing that I would like to end with really is that there are a whole range of things that societies can do to improve their equality. It doesn't have to be redistribution, taxes and welfare. It can be through economic democracy and creating smaller income differences before tax. It doesn't matter which pathway you choose to greater equality. It just matters that you get there. You're talking about and things like co-ops versus the, corp exactly. the traditional corporate form? Exactly. And it's a win-win situation because if you reduce inequality, you'll be improving human well-being and you'll be enabling that transition towards more green and sustainable economies that we're obviously going to have to make um, very, very soon. But how do you so break I think this? This is a hopeful, hopeful set of research ideas that provides an answer to some of the conundrums we find ourselves in. I, I agree, and I, and I totally uh, support all those. But how do you? I mean, Jimmy Carter, President, uh, former President Carter, on this program a couple of years ago said, um, right up. I mean, you can find <laughs> it on YouTube. He said, the United States is no longer a democracy. We have become an oligarchy. And, and, you know, decision, I mean, this is the, 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 the work that uh, uh, was done out of Columbia University a couple of years ago. Um, the probability of the wishes of the average American getting, uh, economically, getting passed into law are the same as random noise. Yeah, yeah. I think the key here is education and our young people. Um, and I think our young people, both, both here in the USA and in, in the UK, they give me hope. I think they are open-minded, they are progressive, they are creative. They know the world needs to change. And so I think if we can do a good job of educating them, then that will be the foundations for us um, seeing some, some real change. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've heard, but we know that if in the UK, if we took our Brexit vote again, we would get a different answer simply because more young people have crossed the voting age threshold. Right. Um, so as our young people grow older, I think we will see changes, positive changes, in the directions our societies are taking. That's a hopeful thing. And I, I, was, I particularly want to tip my hat to you guys for the work you did looking at on a state-by-state -state comparison here in the United States a number of years ago. I've used that many, many times. It's just brilliant work. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kate Pickett. Uh, the new book, uh, along with Richard Wilkinson, is The Inner Level, How More, e How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity, and Improve Everyone's Well-Being. EqualityTrust.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you, Kate.